everybody and welcome back to The Ultimate Fashion History with me, Amanda Halley. And first of all, I want to say that everything is okay. I haven't made a video in about six weeks and I've been really touched by how many of you sent emails saying, Amanda, is everything okay? Everything is fine. If I ever go quiet on the UFH for a few weeks, it's because I have a lot of freelance on. And that's a good thing, right? Because paid work always takes precedence over fun, like the ultimate fashion history. I've also been teaching three summer school classes, so it hasn't left much room for the UFH this summer so far, but I have a couple of hours to spare this beautiful Saturday morning, so I thought I would jump in and do a little episode on one of the questions that I get asked the most frequently, which is, Amanda, what? fashion history books do you recommend? Which fashion history books do you use the most often? Now, the books I want to talk to you about today are, by the most part, overview books. They're a starting point. And then, of course, I, and probably you as well, have far more focused books on things like um, pre-Columbian attire or Paris fashion in the 50s, or um, clothing in dynastic China. The books we're talking about today are the overview books. They're the books really that I go to the most often as my starting point. And the books that are most useful to me in this respect might not be the most useful to you, but I thought I'd share them anyway. But these are the ones that I find the most useful for my work. And what is my work? Well, you probably know if you watch the channel regularly, but if not, of course, I teach fashion history and art history and history of design and all of that cool stuff. I'm also a consultant for the fashion industry, for the movie industry and the gaming industry. And that's really interesting and a lot of fun. And it's very different to teaching. Consulting and teaching are two different things, as I have learned and as I really enjoy. And I never know what's going to come at me. One day, somebody within the fashion industry might rise and say, Amanda, can you uh, talk to us about ancient Inca textiles? Or uh, an app developer might write and say, hey Amanda, we're, doing a, we're creating a, a game for your phone, sort of based on Candy Crush Saga, but the theme is ancient Greece. What colors should we use? For the movie and TV industries, it might be, Okay, Amanda, we're doing a, a show and it's set in the old Wild West, but we have this one character and she's a bit different and this is her backstory. Do you have any ideas on what she might wear? What sort of wardrobe we can do? Can you help us brainstorm this? And I love this work the best. But for all of it, I always turn to these certain books to inspire me. And so I will talk you through them. This is not a definitive and complete list, but these seem to be the most sort of ragged of all of my books, apart from one, which is a brand new book, which I'm very excited to talk to you about. Actually, I have two books that are quite newish. Um, and so I will start. These are Amanda Halley's most go-to and relied upon books. And I have to start with this one. History of World Costume and Fashion by Daniel Dellis Hill. And you will see, I have two versions of this book, which I'll explain in a second. One is hardbound, one is paperback, and I will explain why in a second. About six years ago, my college asked me to create a fashion history requirement for all fashion students. This was a tremendous privilege and I took it very seriously and part of the process of course was to find the textbook, the required text, which I would build the course around so they would have their readings and research from the textbook. And this was kind of fun because I got sent a million books, a million books, these sort of fashion history overviews. I knew I wanted the course to sort of go from Neolithic times all the way through to today and I needed a book that would cover all of that and I got sent a ton of beautiful books. But here was the problem that I found with most of them. Yes, it would start in ancient Egypt. Um, there was clothing before ancient Egypt. 
and many thousands of years before ancient Egypt, so that was a problem. But I thought, you know what, well, I can fill that in. That's that's fine. But then it would jump from ancient Egypt to clothing in Europe for the next 3,000 years. Okay, European clothing is part of fashion history. But where was the clothing of Africa, of Asia, of pre-Columbian America, of Australasia? So many fashion history books really aggravate me because they work on this assumption that fashion is purely a white European conceit and that no other continent dabbled in this, which is such nonsense and it misses um, the rich history and innovation of so many non-white European cultures. And then I was sent History of World Costume and Fashion by Daniel Dellis Hill. And yes, this is exactly, exactly what I was looking for. Now, this is not a coffee table book with all of those pretty Technicolor pictures. But look what Daniel has done. This is such a feat. And you can see how ragged and thumbed this copy is. Uh, I go to this book so often. And you can see he starts here, yes, with prehistory. Humankind before history. What people were wearing. Their ideas about clothing. How it worked. How it functioned. And when fashion started to appear, which is so much earlier than any of us think. Adornment being used to speak to status, to speak to tribal affinities, that kind of thing. Really interesting. And then we get the ancient Near East, Egypt, of course, which is usually the starting point for most fashion history overview books, I find. Um, the Aegean, Rome, Byzantium, the Islamic Empire, and then look what Daniel does. Yes, we get China, we get Japan, we get India, Africa, the ancient Americas, which hardly ever make an appearance in um, fashion overview books, fashion history overview books. And that drives me crazy. Just think about the reliance that the Incan Empire had upon its textile trade. This is important stuff in the history of fashion, and yet many books don't even bother with it. And then it goes back to Europe, we're in the late Middle Ages now, and so on and so forth. Another reason I love Daniel Dellis Hill's book is because you know how I believe that, yes, the quote, fashion is not an island, it's a response, and that there's so much more to fashion history than clothes. Daniel starts each of his chapters discussing what was happening in the world or in that region. What was happening in Mesopotamia? When was it? Where was it? What was it? What were its influences? Um, and so he really places clothing and accessories and the beauty aesthetic into a much broader sphere. Now, I said earlier that there are two versions of this book which is now out of print, but don't worry, you can still find copies of it on Amazon and Abe Books and all of that good stuff. Okay, when I chose this book for my course, it's published by Pearson. Um, everything was great. I built the entire course around it, and then Pearson decided not to publish it anymore. I was like, no, this can't possibly be. So we got in touch with Pearson to see if they would do special copies just for my college which they did. I edited um, this version, the paperback version, by taking out some of the plates, the glossy plates, which appear in the hardback version, and uh, some of the pictorial layouts to make it more affordable to uh, students because textbooks are so expensive. But both have the same text. Both are available on Amazon. I will leave a link to all the books discussed and Ah, I highly recommend this. What next? Next up, let's kick it old school with one of the OGs of fashion history books, and I bet a lot of you out there 
also own this 20,000 Years of Fashion History by Francois Boucher. This book is great, it's classic, and I am guessing that your copy is as thumbed and battered up as mine is because I am always going to this book. It differs from Dan Dellis Hill's book in as much as the focus really is on the near Middle East and Europe. But where it differs in a way that I find particularly useful is its reliance on colored images. There are so many wonderful colored images and black and white ones as well. His writing is excellent, very strong, um, but it's the images I love in this book. He also has some great timetables as well historic timetables, when things happened, where they happened. And some of the photographs I find genuinely useful because they're of such high quality. You know, given that this is not a new book and these photographs are not digital. Wonderful detail that you can really focus on and learn from. This is a great book. I wish it was five times as long and included Asia and Africa and ancient America and all of that but as it stands this is a pretty good book and also given the fact that most fashion history overview books only focus on Europe um, but then again that seems to be what people most enjoy focusing on doesn't it it aggravates me a lot you know whenever there's an article or a blog or a video you know fashion history it's always white Europe and uh, let's look at those Regency dresses again. Oh, look, let's look at Edwardian fashion again. But all of this is, is, is great stuff in its own right, but I do wish that more books had the diversity of Dan Dellis Hill's book. Um, what is next? Not a fashion history book at all, but this one. History of the World by Map by DK Publishing. I got this book fairly recently, at the beginning of last year, I think, and it has proven invaluable to me. It's been said of me that I'm a visual teacher. Well, that's because I am a visual learner, and this book has proven invaluable to me, especially in terms of my freelance work, because I never know what I'm going to be required to do and to research and to present upon. And what I love about this DK book history of the world by map is that it is just as the title suggests. If I want to, for example, learn about the colonization of Africa, how it progressed, who colonized what region when, instead of reading five chapters on this, I can just open this book and take a look. Increasingly, a lot of my freelance work seems to involve ancient cultures, ancient civilizations, and I think that's kind of interesting. Is this a product of the pandemic, us all deciding as a culture to go back to where we all started? I don't know. But this book goes way back. Look at this, Villages to Town. As nomadic hunter-gatherers began farming for the first time in history, Human population became anchored to fixed points on the map. And you can trace here how the Fertile Crescent expanded and when and where. So this, this book has really proven to be far more valuable to me and relied upon than I ever imagined it would be. And it was a gift from Rupert, so thank you for that, because that's really useful. Fashion's palette is essential. Where would fashion be without color? Trends in color, moments of color, the development of color, the development of dyes, of pigments, this is all important stuff. On the channel, I have a series running called History in Color. Whenever I have to address palette in any way, be it in History in Color, one of those episodes, or when I'm teaching or for a client, these are the books that I use, my starting point for color. The Designer's Dictionary of Color. This one is by Sean Adams, and I'll just open it here. 
and you can see this is a pretty great book that is very useful for people who are working with color in a design context. Love this book, Chromatopia. This is really, really fun. This is by David Coles, and it really is the story of color, which pigments developed where, how color is sourced, what comes from vegetables, what comes from minerals, um, what colors were the most valuable and the most expensive in ancient Rome, this kind of thing. This is a really great book. This one is a book I love as well. Color, simply color by Alexandra Locke. And I use this probably more than any of the others because it is the story of not only how pigments developed and things like that, but and going from really the um, Renaissance onwards, color theory, what people felt about color, how they studied color. It's absolutely wonderful. I love this book, highly recommended. This is great. It's just a little book, it wasn't expensive, 100 Years of Color by Kate, Katie Greenwood. And what it is, is just year by year from the turn of the 20th century, showing you the colors that were used in commercial art, giving you the Pantone numbers here. And I find this book really inspiring and it gives that quick sort of flash into any given year, what colors were hot, at least for the past 122 years. And this book, of course, you knew I was going to include this one, Pantone, the 20th century in color. It's one of my favorite books. And this one goes decade by decade here, the 1930s, a nice overview of what was happening in the 30s to make people respond to the colors that they did, what was happening with the development of color, the technology of color, the technology of printing, which of course informs how colors look. And then it breaks down each palette. Deco architecture, illusions here, all of this white satin. Plastics, new kind of plastics. The kind of colors you'd find in toys and games, um, WPA posters, homeware. I love this book. Of course, it has here The Wizard of Oz and its impact on color in the very late 1930s and early 40s. The World's Fair, the palette of the World's Fair. And it does this decade by decade. I love this book. It is so inspiring. What's next? For those of you who watch the channel regularly will know that I have a series on the channel called Bay Film Fashion. And I would probably say that 20th century movie costumes are one of my prime areas of interest. Um, I'm crazy about movie costumes, movie wardrobes. I love studying them and analyzing them, which is why I started that series, Faith Film Fashion. And when I start an episode of Faith Film Fashion, these are the three books I go to first. Hollywood Costume by Deborah Nadelman Landis. Creating the Illusion. I love this book by Jay Jorgensen and Donald Scoggins. This focuses designer by designer, really analyzing the work of the grades of your Travis Bantons, your Ori Kellys, your Adrians, your Dolly Trees. Uh, all of the greats are here. And finally, this one, Edith Head, again, by Jay. I love Edith Head. Whenever I'm doing a faith film fashion and Edith Head is the designer, this is the book I grab. I recommend all of these. If you have to buy one, which would it be? All three of these books are absolutely wonderful and scholarly and inspiring with beautiful photographs. But if I had to recommend one above the others, which I, I hate doing, I hate rating and ranking things, but the book that I would choose would be this one by Deborah Nijulman Landis, simply because it really is an overview, not just of designers, but of how the costume industry works. 
Um, it has wonderful pictures. And of course, Deborah is the, the, the star of academic discussion and writing of Hollywood costumes. She's got a PhD in it. Love Deborah. What's up next? Oh, these are heavy. Art History, Volume 1. And Art History, Volume 2 by Marilyn Stockstad. I teach Art History, sometimes Art History 101 or Art History and Fashion, that kind of thing, as college courses. But fashion and art are symbiotic. And no matter what, I'm working on, I always look at the art of the era and I love these two books because they're very nice quick overviews. I was an art history undergrad and um, I don't remember everything that I learned. I'll try to be thinking of a painting by a, a Dutch landscape painter that I know that I learned about and I want this picture because the colours in it are so germane to something I want to show a client and I can't remember what the guy's called. I'll go in here and he will be in one of these books. Love this book. It's a great uh, art history overview book. It goes from ancient, ancient times all the way through to today. And it includes international art as well. It doesn't just focus on Europe. So these two are absolute go-tos for me. I love them. Next up, a book I absolutely love and I've really come to rely upon this one. The Hard Bound Catalog Book from the Museo de la Moda in Santiago, Chile. Now you always hear me talking about the Museo de la Moda, don't you? Because it's my favorite place on the planet. And I am privileged enough and lucky enough and fortunate enough to work for the Museo de la Moda and I love this book. It catalogues just some of the garments and accessories in the museum's permanent collection, just some of them. But take a look, take a look inside and you will see why I love it so much. Look at how clear and beautiful these photographs are and look at the detail. So the detail pulled through from this ensemble on the right to the detail of the shawl on the left. So you can really focus in and see how these textiles were worked, how the shawl was woven, how the embroidery and the tassels were added. It's absolutely fantastic. And I also love that as well as these beautifully detailed, clear, very high resolution photographs, they are teamed with contemporaneous images, contemporaneous photographs. So you can really see how each era saw these garments, wore these garments, felt about these garments. I love this book. It is really, really beautiful. And sometimes I just leave it out on the coffee table because when anyone comes to visit or they come over for a, a, a coffee or a drink, within three minutes, they're picking up this book and fawning over it. So I highly recommend this one. What's up next? Fashions in Makeup by Richard Corson. This was a book that I had been looking for for years, years and years because it's out of print. And then, unbelievably, I found it in a tiny little secondhand bookshop in the middle of the countryside in Ontario. I leapt upon it and it cost like 10 bucks or something, and it costs hundreds online, I think. Um, but I think probably if you root around on eBay, you might find a copy. I love this book, and I'll tell you why. Because it is exactly what it claims to be, a complete history of fashions in makeup. Ancient civilization, the Middle Ages, all the way through to the Restoration, uh, the late 17th century, on and on it goes. Again, the focus tends to be on European fashion, which is a bit of a shame because, as we know, makeup is such an integral part of cultures beyond European white culture. But still, this is a pretty definitive book on European makeup and makeup in the near Middle East, further back. 
and it has wonderful pictures. It's all in black and white. I wish there were color plates because color is so important when it comes to makeup. But it really does talk you through every era, every era's beauty aesthetic, how makeup was made, how it was applied, what kind of tools were used, who wore it, who didn't wear it. It's written in a, quite an academic way, but a very accessible way as well. And so whenever I have to do anything involving makeup, this is now my book to go to. Finally, I want to tell you about a brand new book that was sent to me just a couple of weeks ago and which I already know is going to prove invaluable to any work I do involving the 20th century. This one. First of all, look how big and beautiful and glossy and thick this book is. The Napier Jewelry Company, Defining 20th Century American Costume Jewelry by Melinda L. Lewis. And this is very special to me because Melinda herself, the author, sent it to me and signed it for me with a lovely note. And why I think this book is going to be so essential is because, just take a look inside. It is so beautiful and so extensive. Melinda goes decade by decade and then year by year, discussing every piece of costume jewelry that the Napier Company produced and places it all into its historic context. I have never seen a book quite like this. And look at the layout, look at the photographs, look how much love and care and time and research went into this absolutely spectacular tome. The Napier Jewelry Company, of course, was a costume jewelry company. And I find that often jewelry overview books only focus on fine jewelry. And trends in fine jewelry don't move as quickly as they do when it comes to costume jewelry. Costume jewellery can jump on ephemeral fashion trends and let them go. It's costume jewellery. Fine jewellery is made to last. And so the designs tend to be either more classic or simply less ephemeral. Costume jewellery, it jumps on every trend. And Melinda's book doesn't just cover jewellery. It covers absolutely everything that the Napier Company brought out in any given year or given decade barware, deskware, gifts, accessories, hair accessories, and you can just follow every trend decade by decade, or as I said, as we get a, a little later on, year by year, I mean, you turn to 1976 and you are going to see an awful lot of bicentennial or colonial inspired jewelry. So I think this book is absolutely fantastic because we can use this book and the beautiful costume jewelry therein as an absolute guide to every ephemeral trend in fashion and aesthetics and what was happening in the world on a broader scale throughout the 20th century. This book is a labor of love. It is my new favorite book of all time. And I just love it. And Melinda, thank you so much for sending it to me. Before I sign off, I want to give a little shout out to this book, Indian Costumes by Anamika Patak. It's a wonderful book. But the shout out is actually for Ultimate Fashion History Facebook group member and friend, Ivan. I was working on a project a few months ago. I really needed to get my hands on this book. I didn't have it. I couldn't find it. Secondhand copies are very expensive. It's out of print. I put out an APB on the Ultimate Fashion History Facebook group asking if anybody had it. Nobody did. But Ivan sourced this book, found this book and sent it to me as a gift. And I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you, Ivan, again, so very much. So they are my go-to, my immediate go-to fashion overview books. If you'd like me to give some recommendations and talk you through the books that I have that apply to a particular region or country or decade or era, let me know and I can do another video like this. Thanks so much for watching. I will leave a link to all of the books discussed in the description area, along with my personal details. I don't do comments here, just a reminder. So join the Ultimate Fashion History Facebook group where we talk about books all the time. Also the Dean Street Press Facebook group. That's 
my husband's publishing company that has a Facebook group now as well. It's sort of like the ultimate fashion history group, but for books. And as this episode was about books, I thought I'd mention it there. Thank you so, so much for watching and happy reading. Bye for now.